Hello, I'm Dorian Lawrence, the Managing Director of FR Consultants, and I'm here today to talk you through facade and fire safety legislation. There's an awful lot to get through, uh, and it is quite complex and complicated. Uh, I don't apologise for that because the changes in our legislation have been quite vast. This aims to give you a brief overview of those, and I'm sure afterwards uh, you will need some additional help. You're all on mute anyway, but we do have questions. Now, rather than have a mass of questions uh, at the end, there is opportunity at the end of each section. So there's three opportunities throughout the presentation to ask questions. I do ask everyone to try and think of questions. Uh, even if you don't think it's that relevant, ask the question, because it might lead on to something else or a point of discussion. Um, after this, you will receive an invitation to leave a Google review. Uh, we've been running educational classes now for the last six years. We don't charge anything for doing these. Um, I do think it is a criticism uh, of the government that they haven't laid on uh, any educational classes tying together all of this new uh, complex legislation. So a bit about the business, we are the UK's leading fire safety and facade experts. So we cover nationwide, uh, all of England, uh, all of Scotland and uh, parts of Wales where there are high rise uh, buildings. Um, a full end to end solution, so not just from the initial report, we then help to understand what is wrong with the building, what needs to be rectified as an emergency process and then plan the remediation. Once we've planned that remediation, we will deal with all the funding elements and then work as the lead consultant, overseeing the works during the construction process externally and internally. And then during that process, we will gather all of the information for the Building Safety Act and then produce the building assessment uh, case, the building safety case for the building assessment certificate. Our mission is quite key. It is making buildings safer, compliant, saleable, mortgageable and insurable. All very important criteria for our customers. Uh, key that we do make buildings safe and we do have lots of discussions, especially with developers when we're talking about cost and scope of these remediation works. Um, as you all know, we're part of the RSK group of companies, which uh, works very well for us as a business and being part of that 400 million pound balance sheet uh, really does open some doors for us with various different frameworks. Um, as a business, we are chartered with the Chartered Institute of Building and uh, the Chartered Association of Building Engineers, so all correctly qualified. CIOB is quite important for us, especially when it comes to the building safety management side. Uh, the CIOB have developed their qualification uh, for the Building Safety Act. Uh, correctly insured, 10 mil of PI with fire safety, uh, which allows us to work on lots of various frameworks. Um, as we have such a vast array of staff, whether it's a building surveyor, a quantity surveyor, uh, clerk of works, fire engineers, architects, designers, and so on, all of them are correctly qualified. So we have every skill set necessary to undertake the process from the report right the way through to completion of the works. Lots of different clients, freeholders, managing agents, RMCs, RTMs, etc., lenders, councils, housing associations, and the like. And we are AXA's facade advisors, as well as Kivea as well. In the insurance world, we work very closely with them, advising them on risk and issues that they may have with various different portfolios. Uh, we're proud to join the DLUHC as the professional support team for the auditing of EWS1 forms and also uh, that we are on the mid-rise assessor panel scheme. I'll explain that a little bit more when we get to the funding and how this process works. We work in all sectors, so not just residential. Uh, we do get drawn into other sectors as well, such as shopping centres. Um, and what we find these days is, especially where buildings are multi-use, you might have uh, a shopping centre with a car park plus accommodation over that. 
uh, we are then skilled to look at all of those buildings. Testing, uh, we design various different cladding systems and also test existing systems on site to see if they are compliant or not. Really good string to our bow uh, that we test and understand how that test is created. All the systems that we've designed have passed the BS8414 test with flying colours. Um, lots of legal issues in this sector, especially when it comes to who is paying for the work, whose fault is it that the building was built incorrectly. Um, it does generate quite a lot of legal problems and we have a technical legal partner, uh, Blake Morgan, who we work very closely with. I sit on the Armour Property Institute Building Safety Group with the DLUHC and it does create some interesting discussions about programme, projects, financing and right at the forefront of how we're going to deal with this massive issue of defective external facades and defective internal fire compartmentation. I also sit on the Cladding Works on-site project engagement forum uh, and that's a panel that looks at resource in the industry. How many contractors have we got? How long is this process going to take? Tower crane scaffolding, material supply uh, and what actually are the pinch points and the issues? So it gives us some really good data into how exactly we are going to deal with this problem and over what period of time. It is not 18 months as the government thought originally, it is between 15 and 20 years would be my estimate. So what we're going to look at today, the Fire Safety Act and how we do a PAS 9980 FRA EW. I will explain those more as we work our way through. Fire Safety England regulations and how they work, very short section, and then the Building Safety Act, the biggest change in regulations in a generation. Colossal uh, amount of change to the industry and how we work, not just for existing buildings, but for new buildings as well. So we've got questions at the end of the PAS section, questions at the end of the Fire Safety England regs and questions at the end of the Building Safety Act. And if you've got any other questions that you think of outside of this, you can drop us an email at inquiries at frconsultants.co.uk. That email address will be at the end of the presentation with a QR code as well. So the Fire Safety Act 2021. So first introduced uh, on the 19th of March 2020 and became in England in full force on the 16th of May last year. And it follows the government fire safety consultation and it's the first legislative step of implementing the recommendations from the Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 1. The Fire Safety Act 2021 reinforces the 2005 Fire Safety Order. Now, the 2005 Fire Safety Order was always um, a little bit confused with regards if external walls were included or not. They definitely are included in the 2005 Fire Safety Order, but the 2021 Fire Safety Act makes it very clear that they are included. It's broken down into four simple sections, so all fairly straightforward, and we're going to look at those sections in a little bit more detail. So section one covers all multi-occupied buildings of any height in England and Wales must have a fire risk assessment which takes into account via an FRAEW the following items. Now an FRAEW um, it's key that you have that undertaken, a fire risk, a facade risk assessment of the uh, external wall. And in that assessment, we must look at the structure, so the concrete frame or steel frame, and the external wall, the through wall construction. So not just the cladding, the insulation, right the way through the wall to the internal plasterboard. So it's a full check of that external wall. It has to be intrusive. It is not what we'd call a drive-by. You can't just look at it and say, yes, that looks all right. It is an in-depth report. We must also look at attachments, uh, not just balconies as we've shown there. Uh, we must look at all attachments, whether that's an electric car charger, air conditioning unit, pre soleil solar shading, anything that is attached to the outside of the building. 
We must also look at doors and windows within the external wall. Now, this is the first time they have been included within legislation and reporting. We must look at how they are constructed uh, and the risk that is involved with them. Also, doors to the common areas, which were all previously included under the fire safety order. Uh, now, we must look at the front doors to apartments to make sure that they are compliant. We know at Grenfell, some of the doors that were replaced were far from compliant and defective and wouldn't have withstood fire for 20 minutes, let alone 60 minutes. So all of those must be checked. Section two covers the power to change the premises to which the fire safety order applies. And in England, that person is the Secretary of State. And in Wales, the relevant authority refers to the Welsh ministers. We don't expect any change at the moment, but it may happen in the future. Section three is very important. The risk-based guidance about the discharge of duties under the Fire Safety Act and how have you checked your building is compliant. So when instructing an FRAW to PAS 9980, it's essential that the report is undertaken to the correct standard. And we've developed our own software, our own app to report on that, which meets exactly with the requirements to prove compliance. Because proof of failure to comply with the applicable risk-based guidance may be evidence to establish a contravention or no contravention. So very important that you have the correctly detailed report. It is not a three-page report where someone has relabeled a facade review from three years ago. There is a correct way of producing it, which we will look at in a moment. Section four is about commencement. So in England, 16th of May last year, it came into force. However, in Wales, October 21, uh, they looked at the guidance, decided that they liked it in Wales and uh, proceeded with it straight away. So really good attitude towards uh, health and safety and trying to make their buildings safe. The government have introduced a fire risk assessment prioritisation tool to help everyone look at exactly how you should be assessing your buildings and what type of risk they produce. You can upload the tool on the government website, very easy to use, worth just checking even if you own a flat in a block. Uh, whether you live there or you rent it out, worth just looking at it and seeing exactly where your flat sits. Um, you have to produce the information uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, I won't read it all through, but there's quite a lot of information to gather, but most of it is quite easily available. So you should be able to uh, look at that or estimate that. We do a lot of gathering of this in information, but it will then tell us exactly where the rating sits, whether it's priority one, two, uh, being quite high or very high, and then dropping down to three, four, and five. Um, very simple to use, very quick to use, good idea by the government, and it does help push um, our customers in the right direction to understand if they have an urgent issue or not. But I'd encourage anyone that is involved in any form of fire safety in residential or multi-use buildings uh, to upload the tool and try and just have a go and see how it works. So the Fire Safety Act in summary, the act clarifies the responsible person uh, with multi-occupied residential buildings must manage and reduce the risk of fire for the structure and the external walls of the building, including cladding, balconies and windows and entrance doors to individual flats that open into common parts. And for now on in England, well, the RP is a legal responsibility to commission a fire risk assessment. So it's not guidance. It's not, yes, I think we'll do it. I don't think we'll bother. It is a mandatory requirement. It applies to all multi-occupied residential buildings and is not dependent on the height of the building. It allows the fire and rescue service to enforce against non-compliance. And we're seeing a lot more prohibition notices being served by the fire service uh, to see uh, to get the uh, building empty if they feel it is not safe. There was actually a large block this week uh, in Manchester called uh, Sky uh, Skyline Apartments. 
and that was um, forced to move all residents out in, within 24 hours into hotels. So we are now seeing the fire service catching up and really pushing to get fire safety under control. So how would we undertake a fire risk assessment of the external wall to the PAS 9980? All sounds very complicated. I will try and make it as simple as possible to give you a brief understanding. As part of the ongoing reform, the government commissioned a new publicly available specification, a PAS 9980, and it is a risk based method of looking at the building's facade and other elements within it. Came into force on the 12th of January 2022 and the FRAW to which the PAS 998 refers to is not within the competence of a typical fire risk assessor. So your type one fire risk assessor who does their annual uh, inspection. It is not down to them to say, yes, we've got some cladding. It's this type of cladding. There's no compartmentation. It is not their job. They refer us normally in their fire risk assessment to undertake an FRAW to the correct PAS standard. So it is very key that it is undertaken to the, the correct method. And the method in which we undertake it is to look at for each wall type, the fire performance of the materials, the facade configuration, and the fire strategy and fire mitigation measures. Just for example, occupancy, student occupancy is considered a much higher risk than a private residential. But we'll look at all of those elements for each wall type in each one of those silos and give them a positive neutral or negative risk. And we gather them in a very simple tabular format. And then once we've got that data, which is quite easily explainable to the lessees, the insurance company, the managing agent, the freeholder, the fire service, it does create a really good database of how dangerous or how safe the risk of the building is. And once we've got that data, we would then plot it silo by silo on a scale, always starting at the high risk point, reducing risk, looking at the fire performance of materials, facade configuration and fire strategy and fire mitigation uh, methods as appropriate. So it might be that they all remained in the high element and that the building was highly dangerous. So how does that work in the real world? Uh, uh, a lovely piece of architecture there from I think the late 90s. Building is brick and block. Uh, the render is directly applied onto blockwork. It is not onto an expanded polystyrene type base. So generally the building is quite safe. However, at high level, you can see where the yellow arrows are pointing, the location of some uh, facade materials, high pressure laminate, uh, highly combustible with combustible insulation. So if we look at those risks, first of all, we would start at high risk and we would say that those materials are combustible, so it remains in the high risk sector. We'll look at the facade configuration. It's fairly well protected, that area. It's protected from below because it's set back. So there's not much above it, um, which is combustible, so it's fairly well protected there. So the facade configuration is actually working for us in this example. We then have the fire strategy and fire hazards. The building is fitted with a sprinkler system, so the chances of a fire getting from the outside to the inside is very small. And the stat is that for any building in the UK, there have not been any deaths with a residential building where it is fitted with a sprinkler system. So we can reduce the risk accordingly. So on this mostly traditionally built building, we allowed that small area of well-protected cladding to remain. 
This example gives us a really good element of proportionality, and that's what the PAS and the FRAW is all about, adding some proportionality. Before we had the Fire Safety Act, we had what was called the Consolidated Advice Note, and it was 34 pages of telling you just to remove anything that's combustible. It doesn't always need to be removed. There may be other methods of dealing with it. Um, we also like the PAS because there is expected skill sets in there. It's clearly identified who should be doing what, what their level of experience should be, and how qualified they should be. So uh, it's really good. It seems to have got rid of uh, people that were trying to have a go at some of these reports which weren't correctly qualified or ex experienced. So that sums up the Fire Safety Act. The um, PAS 9980, how we undertake a report. Um, are there any questions on that? We have got Chrissy with us today who's going to ask any questions. Hopefully someone's come up with a question, uh, but let's, uh, let's have a look. Is there anything at all there, Chrissy? We've got just a couple of people asking to get the slides, but to be honest, we can send a copy of the recording over to them, but there's nothing beyond that currently. Okay, please do think of questions as we work our way through because I'm sure that you've got many. Even if you get the slides after and you think of them, like I say, you can email. Um, so the next section, which is quite short, is the uh, Fire Safety England Regulations 2022. So these only, as they say, apply in England. Introduces new duties under the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order 2005. Includes workplaces and the common parts of all multi-occupied residential buildings. A requirement in law for responsible persons of high-rise blocks of flats to provide information to the fire and rescue service. Um, at Grenfell, fire service turned up and uh, the information in the box was incorrect. They, uh, no one had sent it to the fire service before. Uh, it said that there was a full firefighting lift, which there wasn't. It said the building was 20 storeys, uh, which it was 24. Uh, it didn't contain all the information in there about the uh, tenants that were disabled or have mobility issues. So uh, it, it really is important that this information is correct and up to date. Um, it would require the responsible person in multi-occupied residential buildings over 11 metres in height to provide additional safety measures and to provide residents with fire safety instructions and the importance of fire doors. Became a mandatory act of law on the 23rd of January 2023. So very very important that you comply with it. So applies with regards to a secure information box, must have all the details as contained in there. We offer the service where we produce uh, all of that information and install the secure information box and pass it to the fire service and also run through it with them to make sure we all understand how the building will work in the event of a fire. A uh, little bit of confusion over personal emergency and evacuation plans. It is necessary to make sure that your uh, secure information box has all of the information in them about anyone with a mobility issue. There's a lot of confusion about uh, what information should be in there, but you must make sure at present that you do have some form of personal emergency evacuation plan for anyone with a mobility issue under health and safety law. Um, if you don't, I believe the maximum fine is £450,000, so please do make sure you get that information in there. It's going to change though the way in which we look at that information. Lots of problems with information sharing, GDPR and so on, uh, but it's going to be called moving forward at some point, emergency evacuation and information sharing. So in summary, um, if your building is uh, with two or more domestic premises with common areas, very simple to comply with, use the fire risk assessment prioritization tool, make sure that you've sent information to the residents on fire safety instructions and any information to residents on the importance of fire doors. However, if your building is between 11 and 17.9 meters in height, please make sure that you do items one, two and three, plus 
you have a properly undertaken by the correctly qualified person a fire door survey and then when we move to the higher risk building residential buildings of 18 meters or seven stories whichever comes first you must do items one to four have your secure information box you must know the design and materials of the external wall the floor and building plans i'm amazed at how many buildings we see that haven't got any of that information firefighting lifts and equipment all of the details of that and that's correctly serviced maintained location etc and the way finding signage is all up to date and correctly installed and all details of that so quite um quite a bit of work to do but um not that difficult to make sure you're compliant um but uh, again all that information is essential to making sure the building is safe and is mandatory from the 23rd of january this year um, any questions on that, Chrissy? We have quite a few questions for the event comes through. So first off, we've got Gary, who's asking how often he needs to do an FRA. Uh, 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 a fire risk assessment, your standard type one fire risk assessment, my advice would be to do that every year. Um, a year is still quite a long time in which things can change. Uh, for example, uh, rubbish could get stored in a hallway, change of tenant, um, if the flat's being let out, there could be risks that are generated. An FRAEW though, you would only need to do that, uh, I would say every five years, but when you do it on the, on the fifth year, it's only an update. It is not a full-on document again. The EWS1 certificate. So when we do an FRAW, we produce an EWS1 certificate uh, at the end of it. The guidance is the same. We make sure that everything ties together. Um, that EWS1 certificate must be updated every five years as well. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Also, how is the responsible person defined? Um, the responsible person is normally the freeholder or head lessee. We'll come on to uh, the principal accountable person when we come on to the Building Safety Act. There are a few cases going through the first tier tribunal at the moment where it can't be agreed who is actually the uh, responsible person or the principal accountable person. I think from what I'm seeing, and we'll wait to see uh, what the case law dictates, it is the person that is responsible for the majority of the maintenance of the external wall of the building uh, in accordance with the freehold reversion stroke lease. So that, that's, uh, I summarize it like that because you might have, let's say commercial units on the ground floor, your Costa coffees, your Starbucks, your couple of shops, et cetera, but then you'll have a head lease above that. And um, it may be the head lessee that is responsible for the maintenance of that, uh, that external wall. Um, so it does vary on lease to lease. Uh, there's some good legal advice available on it through Blake Morgan, but also um, there's some, uh, there'll be some good case law in a minute so we can get that clearly defined. Okay, and following on from the FRA question, we, uh, Jonathan asks, are you saying that every building needs to have a formal FRAEW in addition to the FRA? So, good question. Um, so, what your type one FRA, your fire risk assessment? The person undertaking that, so we work with Tetra, Cardinus, Foresight, so we work with quite a few uh, different, um, different type one fire risk assessors. It's up to them to decide if they need an FRA EW. So, for example, turn up, do all their standard type one FRA duties, and then they would say, oh yes, we've got some cladding at high level. Yes, we don't know what it is. We'll have to make sure and we'll instruct an FRAW. Now, for blocks that are quite small, 
that's that's an issue. That's a lot of cost. You know, a, a, an FRAW can start around about three to five thousand pounds. And if it's a block of three flats, do you really need to have that done? So we came up with a solution to that problem. First of all, have an abbreviated site inspection done. And so what we what we do normally for smaller blocks or traditionally built blocks, if we think it's brick and block work, we offer a, an ASI abbreviated site inspection with a letter of comfort. Um, about £1,300 to say, yeah. no, it is traditional brick and block work. We do not need, um, we do not need um, a, a full PAS 9980 uh, FRAEW. So, uh, yeah, that, but most buildings, uh, it's up to the FRA uh, inspector who, uh, whether you need one or not. But we have got a good solution uh, for that. It's, it's a quick, quick and simple process to say, it is a, a Victorian built construction, brick and block where it doesn't need one. It's safe, there's no cladding on it. So hopefully that helps. The sales team and estimating team can help you with all of that should you have any inquiries. Um, anything else on there, Chrissy? We've got a lot of other questions as well. So with regards to deep, can you be explicit about the level of details that would need to be left in the box? It's not just highlighting the flat with disability enough, i.e. So no personal details that would breach GDPR. Um, I'm not a GDPR expert. I think that's probably a question for a, a lawyer. Um, uh, but uh, there are standard um, uh, inquiry forms for people with mobility issues. Um, I believe that GDPR is quite an issue with this. And it also becomes an issue when we come on to the Building Safety Act and information sharing about residence engagement strategy. Um, for the exact information that's necessary, um, I would really uh, like you to refer you to um, someone from the legal side, uh, but it is really anyone with a mobility issue, how do you get them out and um, uh, how do you get them out and uh, how long does it take to get them out? The fire service need to know that. So need to know, have they got to carry them out? Have they got to put them on a stretcher? Have they got to put them on a special stair, uh, uh, lift adapter and, and so on. So there's a, there's a lot of information there. So. And is the responsible person responsible for updating the peach or can this be passed to the residents? The, the responsible person with the peach, um, uh, it will be their responsibility to, but they would delegate that to the managing agent. Um, and I would have thought a questionnaire probably every six months, maybe every three months uh, would be um, necessary. That's the way that I would um, that's the way that I would deal with it. Okay. And with regards to fire door surveys, what's the appropriate qualification required? Fire door surveys. We can send you a list of those qualifications. Um, there are there are several, um, but we can we'll send you a list of the exact qualifications. Um, yeah, our team are. Fire, our FRAW inspectors, uh, we've equipped them with, uh, with some of those qualifications so that they can do it. We do have teams of fire door inspectors, uh, but there are several different ones. So uh, if you just drop us a quick email, we'll send you that list over. Okay, I'm just double checking. Okay, anything else? Um, no, that's it, we're all good. We, okay, should we carry on going through? Because we've, we've now got the largest section of the presentation to go through. Um, so just uh, want to make sure that we've uh, we've got enough time. So yeah, we're half an hour in. Um, so the Building Safety Act, the bit, and I'm sure I'm going to get loads of good questions off of this lot. Um, the Building Safety Act, biggest change in building uh, and regulations in a generation. Uh, I had the fortunate opportunity to meet Dame Judith Hackett for an hour uh, to talk through what her vision was and how this is going to work. Um, and the changes are very, very large uh, and quite colossal. And the aim is to eradicate the catalogue of errors that led to the tragic events of Grenfell Tower in June 2017. So that's a long, long time ago, yeah, over six years ago, and we're still not progressed through remediation. And when we look at the stats on remediation, we are about uh, on the data that I've seen, the data that we have in here and that we discuss on our various panel meetings, I think we're about 12% through uh, remediating our high-risk buildings. When it comes down to lower 
uh, levels, uh, 11 to 18 metres. I think we're only about 5% through. So there's a colossal, <clears throat> excuse me, a colossal amount of work uh, to do moving forward. Um, so the Building Safety Bill was announced in the Queen's speech uh, and received royal assent on the 28th of April 2022 and came into force on the 28th of April 2023. The more rigorous regime set out in the Act applies to residential buildings of seven storeys or 18 metres, um, or whichever comes first. So it's key. If someone's built a building of 17.93 metres, as we do have many discussions with developers who say, no, we're not interested in talking to you, it's under 18 metres, it would still apply. So seven, if it's seven storeys. Um, throughout the life cycle of new buildings and at the occupation stage to existing buildings in scope, following a suitable transition period. I cannot tell you what that transition period is. Existing buildings in scope will enter the more stringent regulatory regime at the occupation stage. The principal accountable person will require to obtain a building assessment certificate and you will have to produce a safety case report, submit it to the building safety regulator and to get your building assessment certificate. If you haven't got a building assessment certificate moving forward, uh, you will not be able to have the building occupied. Now think about new builds as well as existing. Massive problem with existing, got to catch up and, and what we're saying now is you need to check your existing stock. But also for new builds, it does mean that new builds will be compliant and we'll look at how we're going to achieve that uh, as we work our way through. So let's think about existing buildings. Um, to April 2023, registration for the higher risk buildings, HRB, to the Building Safety Regulator opened. Uh, 12th of April, we'll launch of the digital portal for registration. And 23rd of April uh, 2023, the Building Safety Act commenced in full. So moving forward, just had just hit the deadline. So from the 1st of October 2023, it will be a criminal offence to have not registered a high rise building, a high risk building with the building safety regulator. Now, we know of quite a few buildings that haven't registered for some reason, whether people aren't taking this seriously or not. I think the building safety regulator, which now sits on it at its own, it doesn't sit underneath the health and safety executive, possibly they will allow a period of grace before they decide to start issuing fines. One key part to stress is that all of this process is financed by fines. It is not through uh, funding by the government. So there is no external funding for this. It just comes from fine. So whilst we're in the honeymoon period, we do need to take this very, very seriously and make sure that we are on top of it. So the deadline uh, then has now expired for registering your building and getting all your key building information to the building safety regulator. We'll look at that on the next uh, couple of slides, what that means, KBI, uh, and how that works. If you haven't put your KBI in, your key building information, not a massive problem. You can catch that up with the building safety case. So in April of next year, the building safety regulator is to commence the safety case process where registered high rise buildings to be called up for safety case report submittal. So you do need to have your safety case ready, I would suggest by April 2024. Um, also, uh, with regards uh, to the registration of higher risk buildings under the new regulations, the principal accountable person must register their buildings with the regulator um, or between 6th of April and 1st of October. A part of the registration process, the PAP, the principal accountable person, must submit a large amount of information about each building. So there is quite a, quite a lot of information there uh, to gather. And if we look at that information, um, if I just plug that through. First of all, let's look at the key building information and that is the information that you would have had to gather by now. But as we say, you can mop that up 
as you produce your safety case. Um, I did a speech um, that was followed by the building safety regulator a couple of weeks ago, and he, he made the same point as, as myself, that if you're already managing your fire safety risks, you should have a lot of this information. So you should have a fire door survey anyway of the common parts. You might have to top that up with one to the front doors of the apartments. You should have a fire risk assessment and you should be checking your firefighting lift uh, equipment anyway and having it serviced. The building should be equipped with wayfinding signage. Fairly straightforward, you'd think. Uh, compartmentation survey, um, not so straightforward. We're seeing lots of people needing to undertake those and prove uh, how the building is compartmented properly. Um, facade remediation plans, again, if you've got an issue that would have been identified through undertaking an FRAW. Structural assessment, got to look at how the building will behave. Uh, so that's uh, quite key information there, but necessary for the building safety case. Your secure information box, where well, you should have had that in accordance with the Fire Safety England regs. Building condition survey, you think if you were producing a maintenance plan for a high rise building, you would have a building condition survey. Um, fire alarm and system checks, surely must be doing those. And fire and rescue service equipment, uh, um, dry risers, wet risers, and so on. How have they been serviced? Your pass report, access plans, and existing building plans, all fairly straightforward. Um, but we see a lot of these where they do not have the correct information. All of that information will feed into the safety case and will produce a golden thread of information. And if we think about that, golden thread of information. If we imagine a thread going through all of that uh, safety case information, pulling out all the key and critical items that are needed to ensure that the building is safe and how it will behave in a fire. Uh, we've then got there the, I do apologize, uh, we've then got there the uh, information in blue, which is the uh, landlord's items, followed by the information on the left-hand side with regard to the residence information packs and the resident engagement strategy. How are we going to engage with the residents to communicate all of this information? For example, just trying to get people to understand the Building Safety Act. It's been hard enough to understand and track the changes in the legislation um, through the last two years whilst it's being developed. So how are we going to communicate that in seven different languages in the block? There could be an issue. We know we live in a multicultural society. How do we communicate that to everyone in high rise, high risk buildings to make sure that they understand exactly what should happen in the event of a fire and how the building should be maintained. So we're, we're going to have some issues. This is a very much a um, suck it and see process at the moment. Um, I do think uh, there will be some quite interesting discussions with the building safety regulator. Um, I do think that the BSR thinks that everyone has all the information on their blocks when actually there is a very limited amount of information. So if we talk about the golden thread of information necessary to include this in your safety case, uh, would go into the safety case report and then you apply to the building safety regulator for a building assessment certificate. But the intention of the golden thread is to ensure that the right people have the right information at the right time. And it's a really common sense approach. Everything needs to be stored digitally. No more hard copies of O&M manuals on uh, stored by the concierge. That's fine. You can still do that. Everything for the golden thread and the safety case and the summary needs to be stored electronically. So the safety case is a structured argument supported by evidence intended to justify that a system is acceptably safe for a specific application in a specific operating environment. A safety case should provide all information you use to manage the building's risk of fire spread and detail structural safety as well. So it's not just about fire safety, it's about the structure. And uh, having been involved in uh, construction, for 35 years and heavily involved as a chartered uh, building surveyor and building engineer looking at structural issues as well. I'm surprised at how many blocks do have 
the issues uh, with the condition of their structure. The safety case report is a summary of the safety case. Put yourself in the building safety regulator's position. It is not going to be possible to read all of these reports. Some of them are very, very detailed uh, and quite lengthy documents. So the safety case report is a very straightforward summary of that. There is a new British standard that's published on how to manage fire safety information digitally, how it is to be stored, how it is to be protected, how it is to be transferred. So there's a, a useful British standard uh, that is worth a read to see exactly how you can work to it. The Building Safety Compliance Manager, uh, we do need someone in this process. It is not a property manager's job to produce and coordinate all of this uh, information. It is a completely separate skill set. Now, we do some uh, interesting webinars with a company called Fixflow and Tetra. Uh, we have a panel discussion about how this is working. Um, it is not down for a property manager, not within their skill set. They, they shouldn't be asked to do that. Same reason they wouldn't be asked to go and service a gas boiler. Um, you, know, you do need the correctly qualified people. And the CIOB level six diploma, which uh, our building safety managers are qualified in, uh, is there and designed to deal with, can the building safety risk be identified clearly and efficiently in the building? And can evidence be shown for how these risks are managed on an ongoing basis as far as reasonably practicable so that the building is deemed safe. How can you prove that your building is safe and can there be occupied? Process that we work to, obviously first one is the registration, then uploading all of the key building information. Then the problems start. We have to review all of the information that is available to us and uh, produce a gap analysis. Now, we're on Portsmouth City Council's framework. Um, they have a lot of information about their blocks. They are probably the exception to the rule. Um, really good data, especially where they've installed sprinklers, they've done a fire door program, they've remediated the external facades. Really ahead, really proactive, um, great working with them. However, lots of buildings, uh, more so I would say in the private sector, have very limited information. We then produce the information to fill in the gaps, whether it's scanning the building, producing an FRAW, a compartmentation survey, then we produce the safety case report um, and submit that for the building assessment certificate. Also, there is a step seven with regards to the ongoing management. You've got to make sure that all of the items and that golden thread of information is maintained and uh, those, for example, an automated opening vent is correctly serviced, it's correctly operating, it's correctly checked to make sure it will work in the event of a fire. So there's lots of ongoing management and maintenance. Um, the Building Safety Act introduces the Building Safety Regulator, and they were having trouble uh, attracting people into the process. It enforces a new, more stringent regulatory regime for high-rise buildings in scope. It was originally going to sit underneath the HSE, now it sits on its own as an independent body. Uh, the Building Safety Regulator will work closely with local authorities and fire and rescue authorities, making sure that the process is working. There is now a PAS 8673 code of practice setting out the competence framework. I do like to have competence defined, whether that is in experience or and qualifications. So uh, it does set out in there uh, what good looks like um, and to make sure that uh, the correct scope is reviewed for the persons undertaking uh, this process. So just to look at some roles and responsibilities, like I say, you'll get a copy of these slides, so we won't go through every line here, don't panic. Um, so the building safety regulator, they are the lead in all of this process. This is how it is going to work with them leading that complete process. The National Regulator for Construction Products, you may have uh, listened to the Grenfell podcast, uh, fantastic to get information from about how poor the construction industry was, will be completely different moving forward, but the problems with products of materials, for example, Kingspan allegedly removed 90% of the flame retardant material 
that they put into K15 and still sold it as the same product. Disgraceful. Um, Celatex um, falsified the test results by using magnesium strips on the test rig, which are um, from a furnace to stop the fire spreading, knowing that their product was combustible. So uh, Celatex owned by Sangaban, there will be some major issues. So great to see that the government have set up this national regulator for construction products to look at the fire testing methods and process. The principal, principal accountable person uh, may be an individual, a partnership, or a corporate body, least dependent, depending on the legalities. Um, like I say, there's some be some interesting case law coming out in a moment, so we can define who that is. As a rule of thumb, uh, I would say it is the body, person, or corporate that um, is responsible for the external maintenance uh, or for the maintenance of the external wall. Um, the building safety manager, uh, Mr. Gove announced in Parliament that this role wasn't mandatory. It's not mandatory, but this is a whole mandatory process. But you still need someone to produce and coordinate that safety case and then run it. And that is the role of a building safety manager. Um, I think he was trying to talk about not being, uh, not having to charge for that role separately. However, uh, it is a role and that does need to be paid for. Duty holders. Now, in this process, there are clear duty holders. There was a fire at Lackanall House, uh, 2009, six people were killed. No one was ever prosecuted for that fire because it was uh, apparently impossible to attribute blame to who installed, designed, who was responsible for fitting those combustible products. Now, there are clear duty holders for every step of the process, clear roles and responsibilities. So if you are in the construction process, designer, contractor, subcontractor, um, and so on, right the way through, you do have clear duties that you must comply with. Residents will now have new rights and be involved in decisions about fire safety um, and have any safety related complaints dealt with quickly. Golden thread of information which which we've looked at, but think about all of that key information that you need to make sure the building whilst occupied can be safe, not just on existing buildings, but on new builds as well. Um, access to health and safety information must make sure that all that information is up to date all of the time. Now, the hierarchy of responsibilities. We did, I have left health and safety executive in there and we just popped a line through it because that's how it was going to look. But now it's just going to sit on their own, the building safety regulator. They've got three committees uh, that answer into them to help guide what is happening in the industry. Now, all building control applications will need to go through this process now for new builds and refurbishment projects. So all of the new cladding projects uh, will need to go through this. And the building safety regulator will have two teams of inspectors, one for health and safety and one for building control. There will be the principal accountable person, probably the freeholder, and then the team underneath them, a building safety manager. There could be accountable persons as well, such as lessees, if the front doors are demised to their properties or balconies. You will have a principal contractor to undertake the works, whatever works that may be, whether it's refurb or brand new construction, and there will be principal designers. Then underneath that, we will have a full team of consultants and we operate all of those roles and the building safety safety manager role as well. So a very busy industry at the moment. Now, some interesting protections for leaseholders have been brought in from the 28th of June. The Building Safety Act sets new statutory protections for qualifying leaseholders in England against remediation. Now, you may have heard in the press, some leaseholders were getting billed an awful lot of money, £100,000 for these remediation works. Uh, I do sympathise with them. Why should they pay when they bought the flat from a developer that they thought it was compliant and safe? So re residents qualify if their property is in a building above 11 metres or five storeys and was their main home on the 14th of February 2022 and must have owned no more than three UK residential properties on this date. So some really uh, good protections for them. Um, there is also a leaseholder deed of certificate and a landlord certificate now, which that identifies if it is a qualifying lease, how much has been charged previously 
specifically for fire safety works and how much can be charged moving forward for fire safety work. So if you are a leaseholder in a building over 11 meters or five stories, you are very well protected. If you're under that, you're not protected at all. The old process would still apply. Costs have still got to be reasonable, still got to go through the section 20 process, could still go to a first tier tribunal if you weren't happy with the costs and so on. Now, as you can imagine, the costs for all of this report, if we think back to the slide with all of the various key building information, the safety case report information, if you haven't got any of that, you've got to gather it. An FRAW, that's not cheap. Uh, all of that data and collecting of that information is still chargeable to the lessees. There was an article in the Times a little while ago that said this sector's uh, just the information collecting. It's about seven and a half billion. It's a colossal amount of cost across the UK. And if we think about how many blocks there are, uh, 11 metres and above, uh, 11 to 18, 88,000, uh, 18 metres and above, circa 13, maybe 13 and a half thousand. Um, so it's an awful lot of blocks to gather this data. So you can imagine that that task is uh, uh, quite difficult. So we did take some legal advice on that to see exactly how that sits. And in the majority of cases, it is chargeable to the service charge. Um, there are leaseholder, further leaseholder protections. So you find that your building has got an issue over 11 metres or five storeys. Your first port of call is to go to the developer. If the developer is no longer in existence, uh, which we think is about 40% of the stock in the UK, there is no longer a developer that is solvent, uh, it would then drop down to the building owner. Now, we're not seeing building owners having to pay for this, um, and the qualification there is all owners with a group net worth of over two million per relevant building they own will have to pay in full for these works. That category, they don't generally uh, fit within that, so they don't have to pay. At least holders only have to pay £10,000 uh, outside of London and £15,000 in London. So what happens if there's no developer, building owner doesn't have to pay and then the leaseholder is only in the chair for £10,000 or £15,000 over a 10 year period, depending on location. So there are various funds set up by the government, really good funds uh, and different methods of financing your work. One billion pound fund uh, was quite a clumsy fund uh, to use. It's now closed, uh, but it was the start of the process. So uh, we gave some really good guidance uh, to Homes England and the DLUHC, the problems, the issues, the solutions, and how it would be working. Four and a half billion pound fund, uh, great fund, doesn't cover compartmentation internally, so that is a problem, but does cover the majority of the works in the external facade. So really good, uh, a good level of funding. There. Then we have the cladding safety scheme, uh, circa four billion uh, available. So uh, a, again, a really good scheme. Originally 11 to 18 meters. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, developer pledge. Uh, uh, the developers divide into various different silos, some really good. Uh, credit to Barrett's project we're working on at the moment, paying for everything, proceeding, job will be finished in five months, really good. So moving forward at pace. Some developers don't want to pay for anything, don't want to get involved, don't want to start. Uh, but the Defective Premises Act is backdated for 30 years, so you've now got some good levers to get them to join the party. Uh, warranty, so if your building has a warranty, we have a fantastic 100% success rate with warranty providers getting them to pay for the works, proving that the works were non-compliant with building rates. Uh, it's quite key though to note that if you do, are successful with a warranty claim, they will go after the developer and uh, try and uh, claim against them. So the cladding safety scheme, uh, previously known as the MIB-RISE scheme, was initially set up to remediate fire safety risk for buildings between 11 and 18 metres. It's now changed slightly that this uh, since evolved now includes buildings over 18 metres in height outside of London. So there's some key stats there, um, lots of applications going through. Uh, it's going to be very, very busy. Uh, in the way that it works. You have to be on an assessor panel for which we are to make sure that uh, you are able to undertake the correct reports, then go on and look at the conceptual 
slime for the tender pack together and so on. So a very busy environment. So all fire risk appraisals of external walls, reports submitted to assessors, they are now audited. And there were some quite uh, scary stats where uh, 15 passed with recommendations and nine failed uh, due to the standard of the report. So very key that you have your report undertaken to the correct standard. So what do you do if you've got a building and the developer says, well, I'm, I'm not paying for complete remediation. I'm going to leave some combustible materials on there. I'm not going to pay all these historic costs that you've incurred. You can apply for a remediation contribution order. You apply to the first tier tribunal for this. Uh, we're dealing with one at the moment. Within three weeks, we got clear direction on what information was needed. And I'm really keen to see how this process will work. It's been pretty well thought out uh, by the government and that uh, on each FTT panel, you will have a facade specialist who will be able to look at if that level of remediation is correct, if the costs are reasonable, and they will make uh, an award. So again, we'll see some really interesting case law come out of this. Um, when dealing with developers, though, a process that we would advise you all to deal with before you embark on discussions with them to make sure that your building is correctly uh, remediated. Make sure you've got your proper FRAW, to pass 9980. Make sure you know the height, because that's quite a nice get out of jail card. Uh, some people may think, uh, make sure you've got your actual height measured uh, to expert witness standard. And make sure you've looked internally, because you don't want to do the external works and then find you've got an issue with the internals under the Building Safety Act, uh, because you've opened up to a compartmentation survey, but you've signed away your ability to claim from the developer. So make sure you gather all of that data. And then we produce a very detailed report which says if it was compliant with the building regs or not at the time. And that report is gold dust when we're talking to uh, warranty providers because that triggers the claim. Within the Building Safety Act, there are three gateways that must be complied with. One at planning stage, one before the building work starts, and one when the building works are complete. Um, at the planning stage, you've got to produce a fire statement, uh, basically a fire strategy to show that you have thought and considered the risks. Then at gateway two, you've got to make sure that you're showing on your drawings that the building regulations are being complied with. Um, construct and duty holders will need to submit critical information on the building to the building safety regulator to demonstrate how the building once built will comply with the requirements of the building regulations. Then gateway three, uh, you've got to prove what was on those drawings at gateway two is actually what's installed. Thousands of cases uh, where the clever old QS has got hold of the uh, drawings, value engineered the build down removed many of the key items such as compartmentation. At Grenfell, there's a very interesting email that came out where they took all of the compartmentation out around windows and said that they were now down to budget and agreement was made. So you've got to prove now that what is on those drawings has been installed at Gateway 3. So uh, again, really good changes uh, to ensure that our buildings moving forward are safe. High risk building regulations 2023. So a high risk building is a building in England that is at least 18 metres in height or at least seven storeys and contains at least two residential units. So this has now been set in December. Uh, so there are clear uh, regulations on this. Uh, so there can be no trying to uh, get out of it. So in summary, the Building Safety Act uh, applies to new high risk buildings residential buildings 18 metres or seven storeys and above in height with two or more residential buildings, but it also applies to existing buildings. And this is where the big change in this act is because we're now talking about retrospectively checking that all our buildings are safe. We haven't had to do that before uh, to this standard as well with clear and concise process. So first of all, you have to register, produce your golden thread of information, gather all of that data, produce the building safety case and the report summary and apply for your building assurance approval for occupation. Uh, be interesting to see uh, the uh, when 
they start checking these reports uh, if they're of good quality or not. If they're not of good quality, uh, you do get a penalty, and then you have to pay to resubmit. Again, think about that being funded through fines. And then there'll be annual management and revision of documentation. So uh, the Building Safety Act, there must be some questions on this one, Chrissy. Um, if you'd like to uh, read any out, I'll do my best to answer them. Of course, no worries at all. So um, could you please clarify the difference between an AP and an RP, please? Um, I, we'll have to give you the written documentation on that. There is uh, there's quite a lengthy uh, definition for each. Um, you, I think really what you've got to worry about is the principal accountable person would probably be the responsible person. However, the accountable person, if, when we're looking at the Building Safety Act, it, there, there, there could be a multitude of them. Um, it could be a lessee. Um, it could be um, the leaseholder of another part of the building, uh, 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 perhaps um, Costa Coffee, I use the example of on the ground floor, it could be them as a lessee, could be an account person because they're responsible for maintaining part of their building. Um, it could be the lessee if the balconies or the front doors are demised to them. Um, we can send you through the uh, legal definition. In most cases though, I think the uh, principal accountable person would probably be the responsible person defined under the Fire Safety Act. Okay. I want to say that 18 metres high. Um, so where is that measurement coming from? Are we going to the apex of the roof? Are we going to top floor level? Where do we get those measurements from? Wow. A good, good bit of guidance on the government website. Uh, there's also some good guidance in the building regulations. It is from the lowest point of ground. So let's imagine the building is on a slope. And there's a really good diagram on the government website to the finished floor level of the uppermost habitable story. So if you've got a lift motor room on the roof, that doesn't apply. The habitable story. So if you've got a bedroom on the top floor, it is the finished floor level of that, not the roof of the building. Um, so there is a lot of confusion and it's from the lowest point. So if the building's on a slope, uh, let's say at the front of the building is lower, you measure it from the lowest ground level point to the finished floor level of the uppermost story. Have a little look on the government website. If you're stuck, drop us an email and we can uh, send you some diagrams on that exactly how it's calculated. There are a couple of you I have to say that have sent questions in which I'm going to respond back to you, give you the email address, you can contact you that way. But in addition to that, um, have you ever seen any instances of new build high rise buildings being registered prior to occupation? Yes, well, that will happen now all the time. So from uh, I think it was last uh, Friday, all buildings now have to go through the new process where gateways one, two and three will apply. Um, so you will have to do your fire statement um, with gateway one um, and then you will have to apply for um, you get, comply with gateway two, making sure that you've got all your drawings correctly detailed and then gateway three at occupation stage. So uh, make sure that you have applied to the building safety regulator. I would say the process for new builds is much easier to get it right uh, at the new build stage. Gathering all that data on historic buildings is, is quite difficult. We're really good at it. Um, but but it's quite a difficult task if you think trying to get into every apartment to check certain issues, for example, just trying to produce floor plans, mm -hmm. making sure that we get them right. Um, so there can be some uh, there can be some issues there. Also, can you please explain the distinction between a flat front door and fire door? Oh, so uh, a flat apartment front door, uh, the door oh, yeah. into the apartment. Um, the flat may uh, have fire doors internally as well, depending on the layout, but also, so the flat front door probably uh, will uh, most definitely need to be a fire door of some description. We'd have to look at the specification, depending on the height of the block, whether that's an FD uh, 30, 60 or 90. But then you've got fire doors to the communal areas as well, where your fire doors um, are key to the fire strategy of the building, where, for example, uh, you have to go through them to get to a safe area so that the smoke can't get through them or fire can't progress further. 
Um, but what we've seen, especially when it comes to front doors, a lot of apartments have changed their front door to a decorative type door, glazed uh, door, which isn't a correct fire door. You know, fire door has, and frame, has been tested to prove if it resists for 30, 60 or 90 minutes. Uh, for example, if it has glazing in, it has to be of a certain type. It has to have intumescent strips in it to stop any smoke or fire getting through. It also has to have the correct door closer on there that has to be tested. Um, yeah, we could give you some criteria on that actually of, uh, of what we look at when we're testing fire doors. Okay, brilliant. Okay, anything else, Griffey? Yeah, Piers, I'd like to revisit um, talking about the police again. So when your fire risk assessors undertake a review, what would they expect to see in the information box for the report to be satisfied uh, to be satisfied that their PEEPs expectation has been met? Um, well, they would expect to see a standard type questionnaire for people with mobility issues. But on that slide that we looked at under the Fire Safety England regulations, it does clearly detail all the information there that is needed in there. And we offer a process to put all of that information together if you haven't got a secure information box installed. We even put the secure information box in. Um, uh, so we'll send you the slides. That will give you all the list. But the peeps, uh, it's anyone with a mobility issue. Uh, how are you going to get them out of that building? Uh, what does the fire service want to know about those, those persons? Uh, uh, what are their mobility issues? Um, really difficult to keep up to date and uh, really difficult to share that information and not breach GDPR. That's why it's out for consultation again. So uh, again, via our newsletter, we will be issuing uh, updates on that. Um, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, um, you will get a link to it when we send you through your CPD certificate. And then with regard to other questions, I think we need to deal with those a little bit separately so we can give them some proper advice specific to their building. Right, okay. Quite happy to quite happy to do that. Um, that's not a problem. There's just a couple more a couple more uh, slides uh, left to run through. So uh, I'll get through those and then if anyone's got anything right at the end, then please do. Uh, please do shout. Um, so the Fire Safety Act 2021 makes assessing the external walls, including attachments and flat entrance doors in multi-occupied buildings of any height mandatory uh, requirement, meaning that even buildings that do not fall into scope of the Building Safety Act are protected. So think of it as two units or more, but don't forget we can offer you an abbreviated created site inspection to make sure that you're compliant or not. So that if you've got a block of flats uh, in a Victorian house converted, we can offer you a sensible uh, cost solution to that. The Fire Safety England Regulations 2022 have been introduced as an important step towards implementing the recommendations of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry, and they are now mandatory. I really like that slide that we've got in here that says one, two, and three. Uh, four for buildings of 11 to 17.9 then five six seven eight nine to uh buildings of uh 18 meters so 17.9 and above um that's really useful you will get a copy of those if you need help translating that let us know um the building safety act came into full force 28th of april this year so don't forget this is a colossal change new and existing buildings over 18 meters and seven stories will be subject to a stringent new set of requirements including safety case reports and golden thread um, please remember that any building five stories and 11 meters is protected from sending uh, them bills for fire safety and structural defects so you need to be very well protected well, so what, what we did with the business was produce a solution, not just dealing with the works, dealing with the funding, dealing with the legal issues as well, joining all of this quite complicated jigsaw together. All pieces of legislation are going to greatly enhance the life safety of our building to make sure that we do never see a tragic event uh, as Grenfell ever happen again. Um, it, it just uh, it cannot happen again. And we do our utmost here to make sure that we come up with a sensible solution with regards to how we work at a cost efficient uh, way. Um, so your whole process, uh, this is fairly straightforward, although it might look a little bit complicated. Your first part of the process is to undertake the type one fire risk assessment and then 
undertake an FRAW if you've got cladding or the fire risk assessor says they've got concerns because it might look like brickwork, but it might be cladding as brickwork. Then undertake a type two or type four fire risk assessment. That is intrusive to either the common areas, type two, type four, intrusive to the common areas and the apartment. Now your type one fire risk assessor would be saying that they have concerns or suspicions. And we discussed this closely with Hampshire Fire Service um, of the exact wording with, with armor, exactly what should you be uh, identifying as a type one fire risk assessment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, update your fire risk assessment then look at the cost for those works. We will prepare an estimate on those works, but we'll also look at emergency works to allow the building to be occupied. So for example, we'll meet the fire service, we'll discuss with them a method of perhaps getting a alarm system installed and so on to make sure the building can be safely occupied. We'll then produce a detailed tender pack and make sure that uh, we've got the right scope of works and send that out to tender. We do put conceptual design within that tender pack. Once we've got all the quotes in, we analyze them. Contractors love to try and replace materials for cheaper ones and so on. We do a very detailed tender report on that. We then place the contract. We will then oversee the works as lead consultant and clerk of works running the project. Every role that's necessary, building surveyor, quantity surveyor, fire engineer, designer, clerk of works, we deal with all of that in-house. And then we will gather all of the information for the Building Safety Act to make sure that you can get your building safety case whilst we're doing the um, remediation works, we will be looking at internally and gathering that data as, as well. So a full end-to-end -end, uh, joined up process, simple tick list that we've developed just to try and help you with what you need to do for each one. Again, you'll get that with a copy of the slides and and then um, our key services, what we do, we've explained most of these two. So your fire risk assessments, your abbreviated site inspections, if you're concerned with a letter of comfort, you can uh, do that on a very sensible uh, price to make sure that you're offering value for money. Um, an FRAW, full FRAW, we deal with everything, access, opening up the works, writing the report, signing it off, fire engineers, building surveyors, uh, collecting all the correct data in accordance with the PAS 9980 standard. Uh, the whole of the Building Safety Act compliance from start to finish, gathering that data, looking at what you need, putting the safety case together and submitting that. We've even been registering the buildings up to uh, a couple of weeks ago. Any fire engineering services that you need and uh, review of legal notices where we're seeing a fire service under the Fire Safety Act serve lots of prohibition and enforcement notices. We will review those meet a lot of our fire engineers are ex fire service and we will meet the fire service and work our way through those to see how we can work together that the secret is working together with the fire service if you're in trouble over something and trying to come up with a sensible solution we look at order of cost estimates for all of the works externally and internally and then we run that whole lead consultancy role from start to finish, including the clerk of works, which is a necessary uh, duty uh, to make sure that the works are being installed correctly. I've got to say, all of our projects, we've completed about 25 tower blocks now. Um, all of those blocks that have had external facades remediated to a fantastic standard. And it's really interesting to discuss it with contractors once uh, our clerk of works have picked them up on a couple of items, perhaps, and how they move forward. So really pleased with the way in which the construction industry has bought into improving the quality of their work. Applicants rep, we understand that managing agents, broken, lots of work, too much work, uh, can't, uh, haven't got the resources to deal with funding applications, uploading the documents, meeting Homes England, uh, GLA, so we offer that service to help out. So any duties that the managing agent can't deal with, we can assist you in that process. And then with regards to new buildings, so don't forget they've got to complete comply with the Building Safety Act. Um, we, we will undertake the uh, Gateway 1, 2 and 3 design and review works to make sure and even production of the fire statements. Um, so that's it from me. Um, uh, if you need to ask any other questions, please don't hesitate to email. Uh, it's on the top 
right there, inquiries at FR Consultants. Um, we don't charge anything for doing educational sessions, never have done, never will do. Um, I, I see it as a duty to try and get everyone to understand this legislation. If everyone understands the legislation, then you will know how to meet compliance and therefore make our buildings safe. So after this, you will get a CPD compliance certificate that you'll need that for your CPD records, a copy of the presentation and a review to do a Google review link. So um, thank you for listening. Um, hopefully I've given you a broad overview of uh, everything that is going to happen or has happened and how you need to meet compliance. If you need further help with services, uh, we're more than happy uh, as a team in here to assist you with that and um, whatever you may need. So uh, that's it from me and uh, thank you for listening.